I'm John Robson, and this is the Climate Discussion Nexus Readout, Episode 13. Every Wednesday at CDN, we put out an email called The Wednesday Wake Up, which discusses the big climate news of the past week, significant opinion pieces, and developments in science. And then in these readouts, normally they're videos, but obviously because of the pandemic quarantine, we're not able to film them as we'd like to, I take a few topics from the newsletter and offer some quick extra commentary. For more in-depth information, please go to our website, that's climatediscussionnexus.com, subscribe to the Wednesday Wake Up and check out our blog, and also look at our YouTube channel, that's Climate DN, because there's lots there to share and think about. As you may imagine, there's more in this week's newsletter about COVID-19. But it's not because there's any connection with climate change, it's because so many climate alarmists really seem to want there to be. For instance, an essay by a researcher at the University of Antwerp in Belgium, which manages to argue that the pandemic is, quote, part of climate change, end quote, leaving us scratching our heads over exactly how greenhouse gases were responsible for putting pangolins into cages or bats into soup bowls in Wuhan. The author's analysis gets even weirder, though. He also blames the virus on the way capitalism promotes turning living organisms into commodities to be sold for profit. So apparently the key lesson to be drawn here is, if only China were run by communists, we wouldn't be in this mess. The other connection the alarmists can't leave alone is their sense that the economic lockdown, far from being a devastating threat to people's livelihoods and well-being, is a happy glimpse of the utopia they have in store for us when they're put in charge. Many of them don't just relish the thought of the government wiping out the private sector and replacing it with a centrally planned Green New Deal, tossing in for good measure free education, free healthcare, affordable housing, and unicorns for everyone despite the collapse of the tax base. They think people's experience of the pandemic lockdown will make them relish it too. And there's a curious paradox here. Climate activists apparently regard the private economy as infinitely productive and resilient, resistant to any wrecking ball they might swing at it, despite their being ostensibly opposed to it for some reason. And yet, their view of nature is the exact opposite. In principle, they claim to regard it as astoundingly dynamic and adaptable. Yet in practice, they say that any minor disruption is going to smash it like a vase. For instance, if one animal is affected negatively by temperature increase, then that whole species is a goner, and then there's going to be a domino effect going from bad to worse as its whole ecosystem is wrecked. It disappears, it takes out its predators, there go its neighbors and the cat down the road. There's a profoundly and consistently illogical streak in this view. Why should it always be the case that every effect of warming is not merely bad in itself, but triggers a cascade of other things, all of which are worse in a self-reinforcing rush to catastrophe? Never mind why is no impact of warming ever good, Why does no impact of warming ever cause another effect that damps down the initial impulse instead of amplifying it? What if warming harmed one species, but also increased the availability of other prey? What if it killed off some of its predators as well? In principle, a lot of things could happen because of warming, and a theory that always picks the worst one before looking for evidence is not science, it's propaganda. And it's also very predictable. But, in our latest episode, we present a couple of small counterexamples, ways in which real science has shown that nature seems to have a trick or two up its sleeve to counter the effects or causes of warming, and even generate beneficial side effects in the process. Also in this week's readout, we have two contests, not one. Of course, there's another edition of our game, 1919 or 2019, this time showing you Saskatoon daily temperatures and asking you to guess which one is immediately post-World War I and which one is a tale from a climate crisis. The other one is from our friends at the Global Warming Policy Foundation who describe one of the grandest scientific experiments in history, which is to see over the next 20 years what happens to climate. So place your bets, folks, because the sun is entering what might be a record-breaking quiet phase while greenhouse gases are going to continue rising despite the empty promises of governments. So, what do you think is going to happen to the climate? The IPCC and other alarmists say the sun has almost no effect on the world's temperature, so warming will win out. But there's a rival school of thought which says that solar effects matter a great deal, through their indirect impact on cloud formation primarily. And if they're right, temperature will not rise significantly when the sun's in a quiet phase. Now, that's a very big bet. It matters a great deal to the debate. 
but unfortunately, we will have to wait 20 years to get the answer. Whereas in the case of 1919 or 2019, you can get it right away just by going to our website. Also in our science section, there's a description of an interesting paleoclimate reconstruction of temperatures in the Mediterranean region going back into the, what's this? The medieval warm period? Yes, indeed. You know, we hear a lot about how this or that is the hottest year ever from people whose records apparently go back a few decades, or if you're lucky, you know, almost 150 years. So it's refreshing to get this much longer perspective. And it's also striking because the hottest year they found in the region in the period they were studying was 1648. It's a little hard to blame that on greenhouse gases. What's more, the hottest 30-year stretch was from way back in the three digits, from 876 to 905 AD, setting up Athelstan's glorious reign in England. And here's another interesting, even disquieting feature of this temperature reconstruction is that after this record-setting warm spell in the 800s that saw the happy reigns of Edward the Elder in England and Charlemagne in the Kingdom of the Franks, a.k.a. Roman Empire Mark II, the 900s saw the temperature plunge quickly to the coldest point in the whole record they studied, which certainly seems to undercut all these claims we keep hearing about how we're now seeing faster rates of climate change than ever before, the temperature was stable until we came along and ruined everything, and so forth. The authors also looked at climate model simulations of the whole period and found that not only did they not agree with the temperature reconstructions, they didn't even agree with each other. But remember, other than that, the science is settled. As always, there's lots more in the newsletter, and I hope you'll have a look at it, pass it on to some friends, and make sure you sign up for a subscription if you haven't already. And thanks to the many people around the world who have been letting us know how much our content is appreciated and also helping us to produce it. We really appreciate their feedback, their encouragement, and yes, their support. So, if you have a chance and you haven't already, please visit our donate page. We know times are tough, but if you want to help us push back against bad policy based on bad science at a time when the economy is already in a great deal of trouble, please sign up. Make a small pledge, you know, $2, $5, $10 a month. If you think the content is valuable, please chip in because it makes an enormous difference at our end. And thanks again to the many people who've already done so. For the Climate Discussion Nexus, I'm John Robson.